Hi, I'm Ken Crawford, president of the Alaska Conference, and I want to show you around my Alaska. I love it here. This is not the end of the world, but it's pretty close. I love Alaska. It's the greatest adventure you could ever imagine. If you want to find out more, go to our website, alaskaconference.org, and you'll find all kinds of information and stories on what Alaska is like. There's a constant collision between civilization and nature because we live next to each other. There's a feeling of remoteness. Not isolation, but remoteness. There's something about this country that sets off in me a craving for heaven. Although beautiful and adventurous and everything else, this really is a, a, a mission field and we could use hundreds of missionaries here. The living conditions are a challenge, I can tell you. But the needs in Alaska far outweigh the challenges of living here. The road is not smooth. Going down the beach, you'll never see anything like it in this whole round world. We got 40 miles of beach that we can travel with Hondas and trucks. You count it up, missed one year since 1932. He cut bluff traffic all the time. There went family. Today is Friday, picking up our net so it doesn't fish on the Sabbath. We just call it set netting, but set netting looks different depending where you are um, along the coast. We don't use a boat, it's just our truck. Our trucks and our ropes and the tides. Friday afternoon, we're going into Dillingham. Uh, Got to make some phone calls and do some laundry and uh, so the girls are taking the truck up to deliver the fish and we're going to meet them up there and we're going to go on into Dillingham. My favorite thing about Sabbath is when we're all fishing and we all take the day off and meet together and have a little uh, fisherman's church. The plane sits right down here on the beach waiting to go when the weather's good and the tide's out. So. It's kind of hard to say goodbye because you, you won't see these friends again for another year and uh, but it's good to get back home and miss our family. Always anxious to get back home. That's the worst thing about fishing is leaving your family at home. And we park right over here just a little ways and get our sea, get get rid of our sea legs and need to be able to catch more than a few hundred pounds a day. You know, we were coming in Friday, and every time I think about these fish, I just I'm amazed. It, it's a miracle what happens here every year. It's a miracle. Millions of fish, thousands of miles, and it was the plan of the great Creator God to send them up here to be able to provide. It's just a miracle. We're glad you're all here safe. We look forward to next summer. When the fish are coming, they're late. They're coming next year. They just didn't tell us how late they would be. So there's a big run forecast. The fish are always coming. That's the optimism of fishermen. I do want to welcome you here. It's our last Fisherman's Church. Usually when it blows like this, there's fish, but this summer hasn't, hasn't been the case. It blows like crazy for nothing. <laughs> I don't really have sermons. I just share my thoughts. And I found Jonah. We were searching on our boat for Jonah. There was a debate to who we needed to throw over so that the fish would come. It's obvious in the Nushagag, Jonah was here. Unfortunately, I only had family on my boat, and it was going to be hard to explain why my uncle didn't make it back. <laughs> but all the fishermen would know better to lose a family men and a crewman than to lose a season. The other was my daughter, and I couldn't face my wife, and the last one was myself. And knowing my righteousness, I was sure I couldn't be Jonah. So then I began to look to other boats. Notice the sins. I could point them out here. I've got them written down, but I won't do that. I saw lots of Jonas on other boats, but none of them seemed willing to leave. You know, as I began to come up this season, 
the Lord put the idea in my head, and I, I tell you, God is, He always knows what He's doing, and the idea was daily bread, daily bread. And so I, I began to come up with the idea and just work with it. Lord, what do you want me to understand about daily bread? And it was about midway through the season that I took a, a, a lesson from Joe's book and I began to complain, daily bread is insufficient. You know, I, I felt that for a long time. Don't you sometimes feel like God is insufficient? That he doesn't do everything that he could do? I mean, you know, you want to be in church and you want to be religious and you hate to say bad things about God, but... The truth of the matter is, there are times in my life when I find that the daily bread is insufficient to meet the needs. Part of this is probably a, a penance for when I was growing up. You know, the most, the, the people in the Bible that I make fun of the most are the Israelites. Don't you think they're worthy to make fun of? You know, I, I do, and, and I've wrestled with this, and it started very early on. It probably started in Crater Roll when the Sabbath school teacher was telling me about all the miracles that God had done for Israel. You know, Moses comes in there, and you start seeing plagues of lice, and plagues of boil, and plagues of frogs, and plagues of, of the Red Sea, of, of the sea turning red, the Nile River there, and the plague of darkness, and the plague of death, and all of those things, and you're like... If you see all of that, you have to believe God, right? And then he takes them out. You know, I know God's GPS wasn't functioning properly and like mine there around the line. And he leads them out there to the Red Sea and they're trapped between the mountains and the Red Sea. And, and the Israelites say, you know, God, your GPS really messed up because now Pharaoh's coming. But, but God did all of that so that he could show them that, that he is really God. And you know what those people, they still didn't believe. Can you believe that? You know, I love to compare myself to them because I know I have to have greater faith than them. Because if, you know, all of these miracles and all of these experience had occurred, I'm sure that I would have some measure of faith. You know, it's taken me a while to realize that the reason I like to beat up on them is I'm just sure that with my lack of faith, if all those things would happen... Surely I would have faith. Their experiences remind me, I hate to say, so much of myself. In spite of what God has done, I continue to lack the faith that He is going to provide our daily bread. I was thinking about it and, and I... Uh, I wrote this out. I wanted to share it with you. It's uh, interesting. It says, In the wilderness, they mistook daily bread as though they were still lacking. We read the verse there that they said, You know, I wish we were back in Egypt where we had the garlic and we had all the onions. We're dried up and all we have is daily bread. This manna. And I'm tired of eating manna because manna is insufficient to meet the needs and the desires of my heart. And you know, that's what I wrestle with. In the Lord's Prayer, He says, He promises, I will give you daily bread. And my cry is like Job, it's insufficient, Lord. It's not enough. I want more than daily bread. In the wilderness, they mistook daily bread as though they were still lacking. And as a result of that kind of thinking, they had no peace with their daily bread. They saw that their prayers for their needs went unanswered. Their faith in God and His daily provision never grew because they felt that God had not fully provided. Boy, I can relate to that. They felt they were out in the desert and God was giving them just enough to keep them alive so He could torture them some more. You know, come on, God. Weren't there enough graves in Egypt? Why do you give us just enough manna to keep us alive, but not any of the good stuff? Just enough fish to make the bills so we can come back and go through this experience again next year. Praise God. It was so much fun. The weather was so beautiful. I would rather have gone bankrupt. I'm tired of daily bread. I think it's insufficient. I want enough that I can take next year off. And I can sit at home 
with those big catches and think of all of you up here <laughs> slaving for your daily bread. No fish whatsoever so far. And now we get home praising God. I thank God that he gave me an abundance so I could think about fishing and not actually do it. <laughs> because I'm starting to think it's more fun to think about than it actually is to live through. So my complaint is, I either want an abundance or nothing. I'm tired of just enough to keep me alive. And that seemed to be their prayer, that, that God was not giving them enough to really provide, it only given them enough to stay alive and not enough to prosper. All of this is because they did not recognize the complete sufficiency of daily bread. In other words, they saw God's power, but they never saw Him as trustworthy. They saw all of His power, but they never felt that God was trustworthy. But He always gave them just enough to keep them alive so He could continue their torturous experience in the wilderness. Daily bread. You know the irony of it all is that when I came up here I was thinking about daily bread and now as I'm leaving I'm just like the Israelites and I'm saying it's not sufficient. It's not enough. And what I'm finding is that those who I once mocked and those who I made fun of and those whom I pointed out their lack of faith. You know, the truth is, I'm not sure I trust them either. Because I'm not sure my daily bread was sufficient, John. Is he trustworthy? If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Hebrews Chapter 3, verse 17. The Apostle writes, But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should never enter into his rest? Never enter into his rest. But to them that believe not. Verse 19. So we see that they could not enter in because of their unbelief. You know, it's a powerful story. I, 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 I'm amazed by it. They come out of Egypt and they get thirsty and God does what? Gives them water. They get hungry and He gives them food. And, and He provides for them all of that time. And yet the cry that they give is we're tired of this daily bread. We want so much more. And, and the writer of Hebrews says these words, and I think these are the words that point home to me. They never entered into His rest. They never entered into His rest. They never entered into His rest. Their lives were continually filled with anxiety, with stress, with worry, with cares. And their main concern was, will He give us what we need today? Because yesterday He only gave us half of what we needed. They never realized, here's the point, they never realized the complete sufficiency of daily bread. They always saw the daily bread as lacking. They always saw that there was something God forgot. They always saw that there was something God was holding. And they never trusted that the daily bread was enough to make it through the day. And because of that, they had no peace. They had a God. They had a miracle worker. They had a cloud of fire. They had a cloud of... Uh, of, of of a cloud, cloud of cloud. Every now and then I come up with these great statements. If you fish with me, you'd see them more often. <laughs> we could say a pillar of fire if you wanted to, but I'll just go with cloud since it's working. 
a cloud of fire and a cloud of cloud. They had presence. They had the Shekinah glory. They had the manna. They had the water. They had the rock. They had all of those things. But with all of those, they carried one thing that God never intended, and that was anxiety. God says, here's what I want you to do in the wilderness. I want you to have peace. I want you to have rest. And this sin that they are accused of is that they never found rest. They never found rest. They were promised rest. And I'm not going to go into it, but the apostle says, from the very beginning, the very first day we were created, we were created for rest on that sixth day. So that our first day we would enter into rest. For 18 months from the time they leave Egypt, all that time God says, I want to give you rest. At the end of the 18 months, they never find rest rest. So God says, all right, now this is a lesson for those of you who go to school. Learn it quickly. So God says, listen, you couldn't learn to trust me in 18 months. How about 40 years? Let's see if you know, oh boy, I really don't like remedial classes. I think I wish they had learned to trust. You know, well, let me say it this way. I would have learned to trust in 18 months. After all, I had seen all the plague. You know, I just say this. There's a difference between seeing God's power and trusting who He is, His character. Just because someone has power does not mean they are trustworthy. In fact, for the most part, if they have power, it probably means, well, you know, I don't want to say it, we're in church. But my confidence in humanity is somewhere between negative one and zero. And they experienced that with God. The charge is they never entered into His rest. Why? Here's my point. Because they never considered daily bread as sufficient. They prayed for more. God did not give them more. Therefore, they distrusted that God really cared for them. And they lived in this land between seeing His power but not learning to trust who He was. And you know, I think that's a land in which I often live as well. I know He's good, but He's only about 70% good. He never quite gives me enough. And so I trust Him, but I don't trust Him. I, I have hope, but it's tempered by experience. Because all I have is this manna. And what I want are a few onions. Maybe a little garlic. That's the kind of daily bread that we're talking about. I want to challenge you with this simple statement trust God trust God I was thinking about daily bread and I, I want to finish with a story of a man who got the onions he got the garlic he got the fish and his name was Job Job, the Bible says, got up every morning and he thanked God for daily bread. But there was one who was there and he heard Job thank God. And the Bible tells of an interaction in which the adversary comes and he says, you know what, I want to tell you about Job. The only reason he loves you is because of daily bread. Let's take the daily bread away and see if He will trust you. I'm amazed by the story of Job because when his bread was completely taken away, he says some crazy words like this. I, I don't know how they fit in to daily bread. He says something, the Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. I, I don't see that in daily bread. The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. I trust in God. I trust in God. I lean not on my own understanding of what I need. On that day, 
Daily bread was truly insufficient. You know, I know some of us have had a bad season, but most of our boats are still floating. Job, when that day finishes, it's all over. Even his children are impacted. Job, how do you see daily bread? Even your children are impacted. I tell you the truth, I'm more like Job's wife. Job, why do you hold fast to your trust in God who said He would give you His daily bread and He didn't? I want to bring a charge against God, Job. Why do you keep trusting the one who has shown Himself to be untrustworthy? You know, I don't understand, Job. Believe, he believed that his daily bread would be sufficient. And so his wife echoes these words, why don't you just curse God and die? Look at what he's done. Look at how insufficient your daily bread is. You know, I, I got to share with you, have you ever been disappointed with God? I truly believe that most Christians leave their spiritual walk because they're disappointed that God will not do for them what they want to do. And if God is not going to benefit me personally, then eventually I'm going to turn Him loose and go find someone who will do the job for me, who will meet my needs. That's what his wife says. Curse God! He's failed you! And die. But Job echoes these words that I want to challenge you and I with. The Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord, because He is trustworthy. The words of Jesus echo out. There are days, you and I, it does fall short. You know, some have come to earn money for their tuition and not sure how they're going to pay their school. I don't have the answers, but He does. And He has a thousand ways to bless you and I that have nothing to do with fish and the weather is probably even more beautiful. So why don't we put our hope and our trust in God? I love these words from Jesus. I treasure them when I can stand up with Job and say, my daily bread is insufficient. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. These words of Jesus echo in my mind. He that endureth unto the end, the same shall be saved. He that endureth unto the end, the same shall be saved. There are times we don't get our daily bread because God is wanting to show us that we've not yet learned to trust Him yet. You don't know you trust Him till you go without and you echo the words of Job. All of our prosperity will never teach us to trust or reveal that we trust. But it is in the days in which our daily bread is insufficient that we are called to echo the words of Job. My God is good. Sometimes He gives. Sometimes He takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord, for my enemies will see that He has a thousand ways to give me my daily bread that I have not yet known. And I believe that God will yet provide for each of us this winter our daily bread. Because we may have got confused. We may have thought it was the fish that provided that extra little bit for our lives. We may have lost sight that it was the Creator of the fish who sends them to provide our daily bread. So I finish with these words. Trust in God. Lean not on your own understanding. Trust in God. And those that endure unto the end will see when they reach the married land that they will experience the rest and the peace that God intended for them all throughout their wilderness experience. We can have that peace in our wilderness experience, but it only comes 
by trusting Him. I have learned to trust over and over and over. In uh, my sophomore year of college, I, got, I was uh, attending Walla Walla College at the time, and I was enrolled in the aviation program. And between my sophomore and junior years, um, I came up here and I, I worked my heart out. But unfortunately, the fish didn't run very strong that year. And at the end of the season, my, my boss uh, basically um, apologized and said, well, here, here's what we made. And, and I looked at the check, and it was not enough to cover my airplane ticket home. So uh, it was suddenly I was realizing that uh, I may not be able to go back and attend college again. So I, I took the, my boss left and I, and I stayed there um, on the beach, out at Nushigak Beach. And I spent the Sabbath walking around on the beach and uh, I read the Bible a little bit and I, and, I, and I ended up having a very genuine prayer, heart to heart with the Lord. And I said, I said, Lord, you know, I really feel that I should be going to college and I don't know where I'm going to get the money for it. I'm halfway through the program. This is what I want. And as I continued to walk and pray, you know how it goes. I finally came to the place where I was uh, willing to accept His will no matter what. I can tell you I was there. I, I said, Lord, if it's not your will, fine. I'll just watch it play out. And uh, I'll, I'll shorten the story, but long story short, things worked out to where within a week of that day, one week from that day, I was looking at another check with my name on it for $10,000. And I, I was able, uh, I'll, I'll fill, in, uh, fill you in a little bit with some details, but I was able to get on another boat and, uh, by myself and, and um, I was out there by myself and the fish hit heavy and I, I, worked, I worked for three days and four nights and I, I hauled in a lot of fish, more than I had seen in four weeks. So it was just like when Jesus told the disciples to throw their net over the other side of the boat. It was, it was just like that. I had just spent four weeks working the nets faithfully day after day and pulling up next to nothing. And uh, I went out there. There was only one other old man and myself out on the whole entire bay. The water was flat calm which was another miracle because I was fishing all by myself and if it was other than calm I would not have been able to haul all those fish in. My boat just kept filling up and uh, I took load after load over to the to the tender and uh, it was amazing. The spiritual lesson there is the one that I learned that day on the beach, you know, to, to, to know where not when my when my heart is submitted to the Lord. But it was just a, a major bonus to see that he was in obviously and in, and 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 intentionally giving me the message that I should go back and finish school at Walla Walla College. For my Alaska, this has been Ken Crawford. Thanks so much for coming with me. If you enjoyed watching this series, if you're interested in what you've seen or what we're doing in Alaska, go to the Alaska website, alaskaconference.org, and there you'll find additional information. So if the Lord's putting on your heart to come to Alaska, Call the Alaska Conference.